It great, gives me great pleasure on behalf of the Dean, James D. Anderson, to welcome you again to the Dean's Distinguished Speaker Series. I'm Rodney Hobson, Professor of Educational Psychology and Evaluation and Interim Director of the Center for Cultural Responsive Evaluation and Assessment. Just a bit of background about this speaker series and then a plug for what's next up. In talking to the Dean earlier this week, he reminded us in this conversation with our speaker that this is a series that has history in the last several years and that this speaker series this semester continues on that tradition maybe some of you remember some of the speaker series and lecture series we've had in the past. This one is focused specifically on the topic and the role of faculty, specifically at community engaged empowered universities. I wanted to, again, welcome some of you who are just coming in. We're getting started. In the way of format, ask you all to use the Q&A feature only for questions or for your usual chat. Um, shout outs and variety of comments and references, obviously, as well. I wanted to remind you all that this is this webinar is being recorded and the automatic transcription has been enabled. After this session, there'll be an evaluation email to you as a follow up to the talk and ask that you please take a few minutes to complete it. Again, this is our spring semester distinguished speaker series, Dean's Distinguished. And our inaugural speaker this semester is Dr. Carol D. Lee. In the way of co-sponsorships, thanks to CREA, the Center for Cultural Responsive Evaluation Assessment. Um, thank you again to the Dean's office and staff there that have tremendously helped out. I'll speak to vote of thanks at the end. I would also say that thanks to the leadership of the Chancellor Robert J. Jones, of which we get some of the inspiration from this title, um, specifically the leadership that he's had in leading forth a strategic plan and several goals, scholarship, discovery, innovation, transformative learning experiences, societal impact, and resources and strategic investments. And that at the core of this is, a, is an aspiration to be the preeminent public research land grant institution in the nation. And as part of that, part of what we acknowledge in the way of recognizing our land grantness is our responsibility to acknowledge the historical context in which this university exists. And in order to remind ourselves in our community, we begin this event with the following statement. We are currently on the lands of the Soria, the Kaskaskete, Kaska, excuse me, Kaskaskeka, Piankasha, Weha, Miami, Mascotin, Odoa, Sak, Nisquaki, Kikapu, Patawatami, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw. And it's necessary for us to acknowledge these native nations for us to work with them as we move forward as an institution. And over the next 50 years, we will continue to be a vibrant community inclusive of all differences with Native peoples at our core efforts. I'd also like to acknowledge the co-sponsor, again, the founding director of Stafford Hood, Sheila Miller Professor. The College of Education and CREA in particular is an international community of scholars and practitioners that promote cultural responsive stances in all forms of systemic inquiry. And particularly another shout out for our fall conference at the Palmer House this fall, September 29th to October 1st in Chicago. The final thing essentially before the sections is just to take a note from the Empowered University um, note and another alum, Freeman Hrabowski, currently president of UMBC. And this is not his plug, but a really a, a plug about our series. And that book is worth noting because it serves as a case examination of institutional change and success of achieving inclusive excellence and innovation. 
And part of what, if most of us don't know about UMBC and what he acknowledged, and, and especially in the great conversations with Robert Jones, our chancellor, was just what UMBC is doing to both educate more African-Americans who go into MD PhD programs that continue to produce more African-Americans who go on to earn PhDs in natural sciences and engineering. So the book was written in Powell University as a way to both provide a description of that work there. Shift to today, we're very proud of what we're doing within the College of Education and specifically with this, this speaker series. Dr. Carol D. Lee is Professor Emeritus, the former Edwina S. Tarry Professor of Education in the School of Education and Social Policy and in African-American Studies at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. She received a PhD from the University of Chicago, past president of AERA, AERA past president to the World Education Research Association, past vice president of the National Conference on Research in Language and Literacy, post, past co-chair of the Research Assembly of the National Council of Teachers of English, and also currently the, um, the president-elect of the National Academy of education and also a member of the Academy of Arts and Sciences, Association of Ar Academy of Arts and Sciences. It's an absolute pleasure, Prof Lee, to invite you here to be our distinguished speaker series. And that's the formal. The informal is that you, you're an alum, you've been a friend to the college, you've been a friend to CREA for years, ever since CREA's founding. And I was doing a bit of just reminding myself as well as how much I'm gushing over your work and have been for the last 25 to 30 years. And, you positioning and continually position culture as a central place and your work in cultural model modeling that you shared. And so we look forward to hearing about that today. Um, your ways to also push our work and anti-deficit human development paradigms and ideas. Mm -hmm. And so it's off to you, Prof. It's an absolute pleasure and we look forward to hearing from you today. Oh, well, thank you very much, uh, Rodney. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so I uh, thought I'd start with um, just a brief uh, note on my own journey to the uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I was a freshman <clears throat> in 1962 at Illinois Wesleyan uh, University in Bloomington. And um, there were a thousand students on the campus. It was a small campus, but there were 10 black students. That spring I decided to uh, visit Urbana for homecoming. And uh, there were 100 black students out of about 10,000. I thought I had reached Urbana. And so I transferred over um, my sophomore year and uh, was uh, living in um, LAR, uh, working in the lunchroom. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so, and also to uh, acknowledge the power of the College of Education at Urbana, which has had the most diverse faculty uh, of, I think, almost any university I can think of uh, in, in the country. Um, so <clears throat> I wanted to uh, start off talking briefly about um, the evidence of the impact of racism, which is sort of the, the foundation for why we're all having these, these conversations. And to argue that one, it's particularly important to realize that <clears throat> white supremacy is just a particular variant of otherizing. That is a construct that's relatively new in human history, such that the construct of race is also relatively new in human history. And anyway, I was just looking at something. Uh, and would call your attention to uh, Isabel Wilkinson's new book on caste, where she gives, I think, a powerful overview of the, if you will, really the tendency uh, among human beings to create <clears throat> some version of the other uh, that we demonize in some way. And that white supremacy as a philosophy, as an ideology, is a phenomenon that is particular to European history, uh, but it is particularly salient in the DNA of the United States. Uh, we have clear evidence, for example, in terms of this uh, violence against black bodies as certainly not a, a new phenomenon, uh, <clears throat> uh, was clearly um, um, essential 
to the practice of enslavement during what many of us call the African Holocaust of enslavement, <clears throat> certainly through lynching that you saw uh, through the attacks during the civil rights movement. I can remember 10 years old uh, witnessing the uh, murder and lynching of Emmett Till and certainly through the most recent um, enactments that we're seeing in terms of terrorism by police forces. Uh, we could make similar arguments, unfortunately, uh, to other <clears throat> communities, particularly indigenous communities, Latinx, Asian Pacific Islander communities uh, over time. Uh, in addition, they're clearly the practices that have contributed to persistent intergenerational poverty, redlining in real estate, unemployment, discrimination, lack of accesses to resources in terms of ongoing uh, deep poverty, lack of adequate access to healthcare, food deserts, sort of broad scale stereotyping, which still continues, and certainly inadequate access to equitable educational opportunities in terms of who's teaching in the teaching force, what qualifications, um, differences in financial supports between schools in poor districts and, 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 uh, and rich districts, impacts of formal school desegregation after Brown, documenting the tremendous loss of black teachers and black administrators uh, in the South, differential discipline practices, less access to rigorous curriculum. So we know that, the, the, that this has been and continues to be a significant um, unfortunate aspect really of the character of the country. And one of the uh, inspirations I'm sure for this speaker series and the work that many people here do, certainly faculty at UIUC, is to uh, use our research in ways to address these challenges. However, I think it's also equally important that we understand resilience in these communities, historically, as well as today. There is, uh, I'm heading up a project with the National Academy of Education on preparing youth to engage in civic reasoning and discourse. And one of the chapters, uh, this is a report that should be coming out sometime in February. One of the chapters we've entitled Lessons Learned. And there are sections in there uh, providing historical and contemporary examples of uh, education for self-reliance, for resilience in uh, education um, organized by within the communities themselves uh, in terms of African-American, Latinx, Indigenous, um, Asian American, Pacific Islander, as well as a section on Appalachia because uh, one of the uh, interesting um, sort of outgrowths, I think, of um, the way in which this ideology rolls out is interestingly enough that poor whites uh, tend to be very absent from the conversations. Uh, in terms of examples of resilience historically, we can think, for example, many of you know that Wall Street uh, was in the 16, 1700s an African burial ground. And through efforts uh, largely led by the Schomburg Center for Black Culture in the, in the 90s, uh, the community was able to get uh, this space recognized as sacred, sacred burial ground as a wonderful monument that's been built uh, to, to honor this sacred burial space. As part of that work, they commissioned archeologists from Howard University to dig up remains. There was clear evidence, I don't know why this is here, excuse me. There's clear evidence of ill health, but what they found that they hadn't expected is that people were buried with markings on the body, uh, ambulance and in positions that signified, I'm Yoruba, I'm Akan, I'm Igbo, that they did not in any way internalize the perceptions uh, about them as being less than human. They understood their, uh, the continuity and the power of their uh, African ancestry and, and sought to signify going into 
eternity that we would uh, discover what they saw about themselves. Uh, <clears throat> there's also obviously Jim Anderson, the Dean from UIC College of Ed on uh, education of blacks after the civil war where people of African descent founded their own schools over 500 of what were called uh, um, what we would think of as like independent schools and I think over 1500 what were called Sabbath schools run by uh, churches and the community was very clear that 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 the purpose of education was to empower the community and that they were uh, in control and then of course there's the work of Vanessa Siddle Walker on um, uh, uh, public schools under the Jim Crow uh, South where schools served as source sites of empowerment uh, for communities. And as also, of course, the um, work of the African Senate movement, which I have been involved in for the last uh, 50 years of developing African centered schools uh, in our communities. That this is a long tradition. Um, you can think about the African Free School established in New York in 1787 interestingly enough by Alexander Hamilton and John Jay, uh, but went on to graduate people like Alexander Crumble and Henry Highland, uh, Henry Highland Garnett, who were a strong abolitionists and Pan-Africanists. So the point of these illustrations, at least, is from my perspective, that there has been a historical understanding, in this case, in the African-American community. And again, if you look at the volume, um, civics and civic, civic reasoning and discourse coming out by the National Academy of Education. In that chapter, we see similar efforts in indigenous communities, Latinx communities, uh, Asian Pacific Islander communities, and even uh, clearly uh, at the example that we've given in that work of Appalachia, of uh, thinking of schooling not solely as uh, 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 with the goal of sort of developing technical skills in our contemporary environment, passing tests for example, but a much broader uh, goal of developing whole human beings who are prepared to address uh, with strength and resilience the challenges that we certainly can anticipate that they will uh, meet. Um, I want to transition into thinking about uh, our role as scholars. Uh, I assume um, most people on this um, engaged in this webinar, this, this speaking series, are people working in the social sciences. Um, and I wanna connect what I'm gonna say about work in the social sciences with work in the natural sciences. And that is this proposition that reasoning in the natural and social sciences are always probabilistic rather than uh, in some finite way uh, definitive. Uh, you can think, for example, uh, of all the discussions, uh, thankfully, in the new administration where we have scientists giving us explanations about what's happening in the public health field with regard to COVID. But the uh, discussions are about um, a virus that is dynamic and changing, and our response to it is probabilistic and is not definitive. I raise that because there tends to be a tendency um, in our field, in these social science fields, particularly with regard to, at this point, what I'm gonna use the term black and brown uh, 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 students, but I'm gonna come back to re-interrogate that, that terminology itself, of making claims about um, who can do what, right? So there's that Hart and Risley piece about poor kids coming to school and they're not ready for kindergarten because their parents aren't using these main words as opposed to the question of what does it mean for kindergarten to be ready for children? Um, and uh, that as opposed to the public understanding and ourselves understanding that claims that we make about possibilities of human learning are, as I say, probabilistic and not so not really uh, definitive. Um, and also, 
that science, both the physical life sciences um, and certainly the social sciences have always been, um, at least have never been politically, economically or socially neutral. And I, I make this claim because one of the challenges that scholars working towards social justice ends wrestle with is sometimes the critique that what we're doing is uh, activism and not scholarship. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, you could think historically, for example, about the debates uh, over, over the Catholic Church's um, attack, for example, on Galileo because the, um, uh, the, the, the argument made about the earth not being at the center of the universe but revolving around the sun didn't fit the uh, arguments that the Catholic Church had, but the Catholic Church was a powerful political and economic uh, force sort of influencing uh, what was deemed acceptable in terms of scientific research. You can think about the ways, for example, in which Darwin's theory of evolution and the notion of the survival of the fittest was taken up by social Darwinists that led to the eugenics movement whereby they would uh, use you know, the development of IQ tests, which we still will find social scientists use as sort of correlates uh, of some sort of predictions that they're trying uh, to make. The sole whole development of craniology leading to the eugenics movement that is now morphed into this notion of cultural deprivation or the culture of poverty, which is another big issue and people are you know, writing about these all as ways of using science to carry out what are essentially political and ideological aims to otherize people and create uh, hierarchies of, of human beings. And certainly probably most relevant to what's going on today in the health arena around some skepticism, for example, around the vaccinations with COVID, with the Tuskegee uh, syphilis experiments that ran from 1932 to 1972. So uh, pushing beyond these bounds of um, getting caught in a quagmire of, of accusations that the work that we do is activism and not scholarship, I would uh, uh, point to uh, the book by Donald Stokes called Posture's Quadrant. And what he does is to argue uh, he uses Pasteur's work as an example of basic scientific research being carried out in pursuit of public good. And that is what I wanna argue in the remainder of this discussion about the nature of the work that I think we are all engaged in uh, and that I think was a spark for uh, this uh, wonderful series. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna, argue about a few areas that I'm gonna call new frontiers of research. What I think are new opportunities for uh, us to, to wrestle with that from my perspective, sit at the, uh, the center of this relationship between basic research on the one hand, but basic research in service of doing good in the world, of addressing all of the systemic racism um, uh, uh, issues that we had, or I had briefly referenced uh, at the beginning of my talk. Uh, and some, some basic propositions that I feel very strongly that we need to attack and, and address and wrestle with head on. Um, so the first is, is uh, deconstructing race as a political construct. So I have argued uh, before that I see the ideology of white supremacy acting as a, like a kind of a spider web. And that spider web has this host of assumptions uh, of, that are typically deficit assumptions. And that often what we end up doing in both our research and our activism is pushing against those assumptions as though those assumptions have any empirical reality whatsoever. Um, and so I'm going to argue, and I'd be interested, we're going to have, have time for discussion to get people's thoughts or feedback on this. I think that we, we attack 
issues around race in terms of the political and economic implications of how the construct plays out in policies and practices. But we don't equate the political um, and systemic um, consequences of this, how this construct of race plays out with how we study fundamental aspects of human learning and development, that they're different. We know that there's no genetic basis for the construct of race. We know that there's greater diversity within so-called racial groups than across groups and that the greatest <clears throat> diversity, interestingly enough, is within populations on the continent of Africa. Uh, as I had indicated earlier on, that race is a relatively new construct in human history, that it was created specifically as a moral warrant for colonial expansion and enslavement and would suggest people might look at Charles Mills' very powerful book, The Racial Contract, in which he documents uh, in great detail the multiple sort of institutional affirmations uh, of this uh, ideology in order to provide moral warrants for engaging in inhuman behavior. At the same time, it is interesting that this construct of whiteness is um, ephemeral, that is to say, uh, over a historical time and place, it uh, evolves into who gets to be white and who doesn't get to be white. And I also make a prediction, which others have done, that it's going to be interesting as the population in the United States becomes majority black and brown, and I'm gonna again come back to that terminology, that part of what I suspect in terms of sort of census categorizations they're gonna be shifts into who uh, considered, who gets to be considered to be white. Uh, we know, for example, that the uh, Irish and Eastern European uh, immigrants who came to the United States in the 19th century, uh, in many cases were not considered white. Uh, there's a book called When the Irish Became White. Uh, we know that the eugenicists uh, and with these little mini IQ tests that they would develop would be sitting outside of, uh, you know, as the people came off the, uh, uh, off the boats and give them this five minute IQ test and said, the Irish, the Eastern European, the Jewish people, they're not intelligent according to our scientific evidence. And so therefore they shouldn't be able to come into the country. So I'm just arguing that this notion of, of whiteness uh, around this construct of race uh, is is a, is a moving target, and is uh, I would say relatively uh, I, uh, illogical. So, for example, if we're going to use um, skin color as the evidence of who gets to be in what racial category, it becomes interesting questions. For example, as to why are Malaysians, Pakistanis, and East Indians who come to the U.S., for example, with skin color ranging from caramel brown to deep chocolate would not be considered black. Um, this leads me to another issue that I think is interesting to wrestle with. And in the discussion part, I would be interested in people's thoughts on this. The, there's a way in which particularly in the modern age or now that there are aspects of this ideology of white supremacy that become subtly normalized. So for example, I would argue that the use of the term people of color in and of itself implies an us and a them. And an us and a them is, the, is there's the people of color and then there's the white people. So there's, there's, there's some fundamental kind of difference. Empirically, all human beings are people of color. There are no white people, there are no black people. All human beings with various degrees of melanin have skin colors that range from a very light cream to a deep chocolate. So the, the question in part becomes, what is it that we're subtly conveying and reinforcing in the use of the term of people of color? We also, again, the same thing holds up for the, the notion of black and brown people. So the black and brown people means there's white people, which means there's somehow to us and them that somehow skin pigment, pigmentation becomes a significant indicator uh, implied of some internal state of people, as opposed to skin color being used as a tool for political positioning. Um, but I would also add, so my um, argument 
is that rather than race, that we should focus on ethnicity. Uh, in part, that ethnicity, I would argue, is a more explanatory construct. It has to do with, uh, first and foremost, ethnicity typically has a longer history, even than national states. So you can think, for example, about the Roma people of uh, distributed across Europe. You can think about the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the number of ethnic groups that had sustained and maintain their identities as members of, uh, of ethnic communities despite the imposition of, of national territories uh, under the, the, uh, the, uh, the old Soviet Union. Um, we, in the United States in particular, we have created uh, pan-ethnic categories. And I would argue that those pan-ethnic categories uh, can be powerful in the sense that they can capture, so pan-ethnic meaning African descent, Asian American, Latinx, et cetera. They can um, convey, if you will, uh, shared practices, which I'm gonna try to illustrate briefly in a moment, uh, that are sustained across time and space. But at the same time, they also can mask uh, significant differences within uh, groups. So that, um, for example, uh, we'll use the term uh, Asian or Asian American, uh, which then encompasses uh, countries such as uh, China uh, and Japan and have a long uh, history of tension. Um, um, places like India, Pakistan and Malaysia, which would be considered part of Asia broadly speaking, but entail cultural practices that are different than one might find, for example, in China. And even thinking in terms of China, having some 52 different ethnic groups within, the, the, within China. So we typically here think about China as being homogenous when in fact, it's quite a heterogeneous. But still overall, uh, ethnicity can have strong explanatory power. And I wanna refer here to Wade Boykin uh, at Howard University, esteemed uh, black psychologist is his notion of what he calls deep culture, that is cultural practices that get sustained over time and space. And we can think about these in terms of the example of people of African descent, that I would argue that you can go any place in the world where you'll find large contingencies of people of African descent and you will find common sets of practices, respect for elders, the appreciation of the notion of extended, uh, uh, extended family. For example, there are uh, some languages uh, on the continent where there's no such word for cousins, that the children of siblings are brothers and sisters and uh, belief in ancestors, certainly the, the importance and power of rhythm and the drum, ways of using language that are deep um, cultural practices that get sustained sometimes in even very unconscious ways across time and space, but that it can also offer us great opportunities for thinking about and interrogating resources, uh, particularly for the socialization of young people. Um, what this suggests to me is that um, attention to cultural communities and the illustrations I've given in terms of ethnicity is very complicated and that cultural communities are both homogenous and heterogeneous. They are stable and changing at the same time. And this is a very difficult construct to wrap our heads around, our theories around, our methods around, if you will. So um, with that, I want to transition to talk about what I think uh, for me is one of these sort of um, new frontiers. Um, and that is to think about attention to diversity in human learning and development as a basic scientific question. Um, that it's a framing that allows us to conduct research that seeks to explain and address inequities across multiple dimensions, but also to examine diversity across and within cultural communities as foundational scientific questions. Um, that the idea of multiculturalism, I would argue, is more than a po po politically uh, progressive move. 
uh, but that it is an essential phenomena that we have to uh, understand if we're going to understand in fundamental ways how people learn and develop across time and space. Um, there are some aspects of this that I think are important for uh, uh, knowledge construction. Uh, for example, um, the, uh, the discussions that are underway right now, the, the debate in the last administration, for example, over the 1619 project about why it's important to teach the full uh, history of human communities, including within the United States, is, 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 is deeply important if we're going to really understand what's going on in, in the world now, that cutting out aspects uh, of our history, both within the United States and across the world, sort of limits our ability to understand the new phenomena uh, with which we're wrestling. Uh, why is it important to understand the social foundations of science and mathematics as knowledge uh, construction efforts to which diverse uh, populations have contributed? Uh, and I would argue that there's an epistemological warrant for that in terms of understanding that mathematics and science, for example, are social constructions, that, that our understanding of them has shifted uh, over time and all human communities have contributed over time and space to their evolution. In my own work focusing uh, in literature uh, and the arts, the understanding, for example, a genre like magical realism uh, in, um, in, in literature. And I'm often quoting the story Gabriel Marquez uh, had given the South American uh, writer in magical realism that said that he didn't realize that the stories that his African uh, grandmother used to tell him these magical stories could be written down until he read the German writer Franz Kafka or to think about magical realism as a genre uh, going from Toni Morrison to William Faulkner to uh, Amos Tuchola, uh, the Nigerian uh, uh, author. So my, again, my point is that basic understanding of knowledge construction and discipline requires that we understand uh, cultural diversity. Also that we are at a pivotal point in time um, where we have convergence across disciplines about the centrality of culture to human learning and development. So for example, there is an emerging field called epigenesis in which they have documented the ways in which uh, participation in cultural practices can actually impact the expression of genetic traits. Uh, we can think, for example, in, ter uh, in terms of um, infancy, that human uh, infants um, are born with a disposition to pay attention to social faces, to engage in social relations, to, to, to build relationships with other human beings, to try to read the internal states of other humans, to, uh, to learn through observation and, and exploration um, that, that culture uh, intertwine with the um, physiological dispositions that we have as human beings are the cauldron, if you will, of human learning and development. And therefore attention to understanding the multiple pathways through which humans learn and develop is the most fundamental uh, scientific question, I think, in terms of human learning uh, and development. And the, the issue that I'm kind of wrestling with here is the notion that this uh, tendency of some to say that those of us who are addressing issues of culture in terms of learning, organization of learning uh, settings, et cetera, are either just doing something progressively good for the other kids, for the colored kids, or is it some sort of social activism, but it's not a basic scientific form of inquiry. And I'm arguing uh, just the, the opposite. Um, the final point I would make is that another sort of frontier, and I also will say that I think that one of the opportunities for this kind of foundational research that I'm talking about 
I think requires interdisciplinary collaborations. Um, in my own work, um, I started off uh, in, in, in education. I was trained to be a high school English teacher, went on to get a, a degree, the, the, the master's in English, PhD in curriculum instruction, ended up in a learning sciences program, figured out I was around a bunch of cognitive psychologists and had to figure out what these people were talking about, ended up co-teaching a seminar with colleagues uh, in human development, which opened up a whole new world for me in terms of tools, methodological and conceptual tools that were available for me to wrestle with the complexity of the kind of learning um, ecologies that I was interested in. And so I want to argue as my last point and then try to open up for some discussion, um, the, the opportunities of work emerging around the study of dynamic systems. So we know that in addition to the, the centrality of culture to human learning and development, that human learning and development occurs over time and space and across multiple settings. So you can think about Brock and Brenner's work around ecological systems, certainly Margaret Bill Spencer's powerful work around ecological systems, that these open up sort of new opportunities for how we can engage with the complex issues that we're interested in. And I would again argue that creating spaces in colleges of education, schools of education, schools of human development, et cetera, where we have these opportunities to collaborate across disciplines and get at these very fundamental kinds of questions about um, how, pe how people learn. So I think with that, I will uh, ask Rodney, I presume to uh, sort of open it up for uh, discussion. Let me make one other comment. I was going to show this clip from a trailer for a film called Babies. And in the interest of having time for discussion, I'm not going to do it, but I would suggest you can find it uh, you know, on YouTube, internet or whatever. The trailer was a couple of minutes long, but it's a film made by a French a director of the first year of life of four babies, from one from Namibia, one from Mongolia, one from Japan, and one from San Francisco, United States. There's no talking. All you do is see these little babies, each in very different contexts, wrestling with the foundational task as a species that they have. Uh, learning language, learning to read the internal states of others, learning how to manipulate objects uh, you know, how to manage the, their bodies, but in very different contexts, but their, very different social ends with very different kinds of social supports. And for me, why I love to show it is that it's impossible unless you're just an absolute racist <coughs> to look at those four babies <coughs> and say that one form of socialization is better than the other. So with that, um, Rodney, questions and comments yeah yeah yeah. no that's that's prof thanks so much for this it's, it's a lot um <clears throat> what i'll what i'll um ask is something you've already spoken to briefly as questions begin to formulate and folk know we don't have a whole lot of time in your 2000 and 2015 clip where you're promoting the, the aera conference on, on language and race you spoke to <laughs> the, the need and the part spoke to what you spoke to the incredible need around this work to develop a kind of an intellectual border crossing across disciplines. Tell us about what this work is, because part of what you spoke to again, and this is that that nod to your that, that tension between what you perceived as a scholar and an activist, and also <clears throat> the perceptions of what social justice looks like for those in the academy across social and natural sciences. What is this intellectual border crossing that you're speaking to and what does this look like? Help us with that. Well, a couple of comments. <clears throat> I was doing some work years ago with Lee Shulman when he was at the Carnegie Foundation out in California. And he had developed a project on what he called the moral professions. Doctors, uh, firemen, etc. Certainly we see that today with the pandemic and the essential workers, but he included teaching as one of them. And I would say that that teaching involves the entire spectrum, <clears throat> including what we do, you know, in the, in, the, in, in the university. And that what we typically do, and also 
Another <clears throat> kind of metaphor for me, Barbara Rogoff in her book, Cultural Nature of Human Development, I think it's there she does it, or she's talked about this, where she uses the, the uh, image of a film clip. <coughs> <coughs> And since the film clip is the activity and what we do with our limited um, theoretical and methodological tools is we take one magnifying glass and we look at one aspect that reflects the skill set that we think that we bring. But that singular lens cannot explain all of what is unfolding. And so for me, that's where this need to sort of reach out in terms of, 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 of working collaborating with scholars and other disciplines, I would argue that this is not easy work because we speak different languages and it takes time to really come to sort of un understanding where, what one another is bringing. There's a study that I <coughs> recently completed, recently a few years ago, <coughs> which was an example for me of trying to embody <coughs> a human development perspective, uh, 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 a learning sciences perspective, particularly around literacy his work in an African Senate high school was actually one that I founded. <clears throat> and we were looking at the, the, using cultural modeling and designing literature units that not only taught children robust strategies and epistemological orientations toward literature, but also literature as an opportunity for identity wrestling with wrestling as uh, adolescents in that transition period from adolescents into adults as black you know, African uh, youngsters uh, using literature as a way to, to wrestle with that. And so that was behind the design. The methods in terms of studying it, we included measures of racial identity, racials of, of, of <clears throat> children's sense of self-efficacy uh, and resilience, measures of children's epistemological orientations, you know, toward, toward literature. And we found positive, consistent, positive correlations between the development of a strong sense of racial identity, a strong sense of self-efficacy, a strong sense of growth you know, mindset. If I work hard, I can get things and accomplish things to the academic outcomes that we had. In the beginning of my work, I would have never conceived of such a study because I didn't even know that these issues, I, I knew intuitively because we had been working in African-centered education for, I was in my mid forties when I went to graduate school. And I, I went to graduate school because we had been working in our African Senate school. I had been doing that for 15 years, although I taught public schools before that. And these questions were, I was wrestling with and I couldn't find time to do it while I was in practice. So I said, let me politically escape and go to graduate school. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, that's an example, I think, if you will. So that's phenomenal. Let me, let me go to another question. Um, that came up and you, you, I think you answered a question earlier and that was the role of faculty to address and disrupt systemic racism on institutions. But then the follow-up question was, is there any advice or are there any strategy examples that begin to disrupt institutional power and privilege stemming from systemic racism and justice? I think you gave us plenty historically. That question looks like it gets to something that young, old, seeking, aspiring, faculty might want to think about as their lens prop? So two comments I would make. One is one of the border crossings that I think that we need, and I think across the board, particularly scholars who um, are committed to issues of social justice, is we don't understand the policy world and how it operates sufficiently, right? Um, there was, uh, um, the devil you know, I think there's a the brother, there's a New York Times op-ed columnist. I was listening yesterday, he was talking about his book, he had an interesting argument. And that was that he said, if we had a reverse migration, you think about the number of blacks who left the South because of Jim Crow, returned to the South, we would then be majority in most of these Southern states and the impact that we could have on national politics, electoral college intent would be huge. Um, so I, one is I think that we often don't understand the policy world, so its complexity. And often as scholars, we think that the po that policymakers are subject to logic, that if we create data, 
compelling data that that access to that data is sufficient to impact policy, which I would argue is not. <clears throat> the other is, I think that it's very important that we distinguish between work that we do in the world and work that we do in the academy. So I think we do work in the academy, sort of in this postures quadrant world, if you will, to use our research to do good in the world because we are we're moral agents, I think, right? We want to, we want to accomplish good in the world. But we don't confuse that as the only platform that we have. I have often said, I stayed at Northwestern University for 30 years. Inside of that university, I worked hard in terms of increasing diversity of students, in terms of faculty, in terms of curriculum work and the like. I never confused the idea that I was going to change North, and it's a great university. I'm not criticizing it. I love it. It's wonderful. I never com, com, was confused that somehow the, that the fate of the Black community was riding on what happened internally with Northwestern University, and that the work that we did over, that we've continued to do over 50 years in Chicago, Third World Press, 1967. Institute of Positive Education, 1969. New Concept School, 1972. Betty Shabazz International Charter Schools, 1998. They still all still operating. We're struggling, but we're still here. We're working at our age, <clears throat> my husband and I, my husband, Hakeem Adabudi, to you know, think about the transition of leadership. That we're not gonna be able to do this forever. And so that I've tried in my own way to live my life with a parallel track that I don't have to, that my, my life, that the future of my children is not in the hands of the university, that I have to equally be active in, you know what I mean, in the life of my community and to do this work in parallel. Mm. Prof, I'm, 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 I'm sensitive to time. It's about five minutes to noon. Mm -hmm. I wanna give you a little bit of time just to um, take a break before another small thing we have, small set. We're done. We're done. We're done. Yeah, we're done here with this group. Let me just thank everyone again. Um, a reminder again to the group as well um, that we have email forms going out. Please take a minute to, as you get follow up to the talk, please take a minute to complete it. Again, on behalf of the Dean James Anderson, James D. Anderson College of Education, Dean, I want to thank all of you, especially. Uh, Prof. Lee, um, and thanks to the support of our uh, staff in our office for making this happen. Prof, we'll see you in a bit. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, Rodney, can you resend me the link for whatever the next? Absolutely, thing? absolutely, Thank absolutely. You. you have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Absolutely. I see familiar names on here. <laughs>